Today I'm talking about people who are under the age of 55 and sometimes far younger than that who are starting to get arthritis in their shoulder. How does this happen? If it happens, what are the options to get them better? Many times these people have come to me and they've been told by previous doctors that they're too young to get their shoulder replaced with an artificial joint. And in general, that's correct. But I want to talk to you about more of the nuances and what are some of the options that are new and what has technology done to help offer these young, active, demanding folks more options for getting their shoulders back to normal. In this video, we'll talk about three things. One, what does shoulder arthritis mean? How does it happen? And then number two, what are the non-operative treatments we can offer people in order to get them better or at least stave off the effects of arthritis if it's already started? And then number three, what are the surgical options and specifically, what are the new technologies that have been introduced and have been FDA approved that allow us to offer options to younger and younger folks who will obviously put more demands on these joints. So let's start off with the basics. Number one, the shoulder joint, how does it get arthritis? The shoulder joint, unlike the hip socket or hip joint, which is a deep dish socket, the shoulder socket is a very loose ball and socket joint. We often describe it as like a golf ball sitting on a golf tee. Um, beyond that, there's a little rim that's like a flared out section. We often refer that to, uh, to that as sort of like a suction cup extension to the bone. That's called the labrum, which deepens the socket, but this is not a hard shell. And so the shoulder has a lot of slop, um, both side to side and up and down through a normal range of motion. When we were infants, our, in, almost enti our entire skeleton is made out of cartilage. As we get older, just the ends of the bones are covered with this cartilage. And that cartilage is uh, all you're going to get. The, the longer you live, the less that cartilage will be thick and the less it will last. As the shoulder starts to wear out, the, the cartilage surfaces between these two bones starts to wear out. And when that happens, you may have heard of people getting bone on bone arthritis or bone rubbing on bone. So these two are rubbing against each other and there's no, there's no cushion between them. In addition to the rough surfaces, the bone rubbing on the bone, the shoulder will often develop these irregularities called bone spurs. Um, the technical term for that is osteophytes and they will often surround the joint. And if you look at x-rays or a CT scan, you'll see that these look like, we call it the goat's beard, but it actually is more like the bushy beard. So if someone looking at it from the side, you can see it surrounds almost completely the ball and in many cases, the socket as well. The combination of the painful joint and the bone spurs which grow and limit the range of motion really lead to a very stiff, very painful, and oftentimes a very noisy joint. Patients will often tell me, listen, I hear a crunching every time I move the shoulder. So a typical patient in my practice usually looks like this. Someone who's in their late 30s or maybe early 40s who's been very active, they've played sports. Some of them have had surgery in the past and because of some of the anchors that were used or because of the way that the surgery was done or because of repeated injuries since that surgery, they end up having arthritis at a very young age. In some cases, even before the age of 40, some of these patients have so much pain and they're unable to use their arm even to pick up their small children. Um, it becomes such uh, an a source of disability for them that they have to do something about it. So what are some of the options that we can offer patients? Some of the non-operative means that we can employ is to simply give good advice. Sometimes by looking at the x-rays, understanding where the source of the pain is, and understanding what not to do in order to make the problem get worse at a quicker rate, those patients will do quite well and may be able to get that shoulder to last long enough until they are in a, a more appropriate age group to replace it. So for example, some people who are like heavy weightlifters may decide to do something more smooth, such as yoga, Pilates, or even if they are lifting weights, they would focus on other parts of their body and spare the shoulder from that re regular pounding that they used to give it. Patients often ask me about cortisone injections as well. And cortisone injections are okay, but they are not a long-term solution. And especially since this is a patient population who has to play the long game, I caution patient that, patients that it is more of a band-aid solution it can be useful in situations where you have a bad flare-up of arthritis and you just need some rescue. You need to get out of the pain. And a cortisone injection every now and then, maybe once every couple of years, is okay. But there are some concerns from the knee literature su suggesting that if you get too many cortisone injections, your arthritis may actually progress faster. Other things to consider are more along the lines of regenerative medicine. Many of these options are not proven, but they do have some compelling evidence from scientific literature. So for example, platelet-rich plasma injections have been used in knee arthritis, and there actually have been some studies to suggest that they actually do reduce pain, but I've never seen a study actually saying that it puts cartilage back on the joint. Another thing that may be interesting here, um, adipose-derived tissue is actually an interesting and promising technology. It basically takes 
adipose cells, which are from your midsection, and processes them minimally, allowing that to be injected into the joint. Now, there have been studies done in animals um, showing that this actually will stimulate uh, cartilage to regrow. And interesting fun fact, adipose tissue has a much higher concentration of stem cells than even bone marrow does. So for what it's worth, that is probably technology that it's in its early incubation stage and um, some of those products are available even right now. So in general, there are ways to preserve the cartilage that you have and to make the joint last as long as possible. However, if you find yourself in this situation, you may find that the restrictions that you have to employ and the activities that you avoid may be so limiting that it may detract from your quality of life. For patients who are above the age of 65, shoulder replacements have a great track record of success and longevity. So why are young patients often told that they are too young to have a shoulder replacement? It comes down to two main things, life expectancy and level of activity. Many patients who are in their 60s or 70s are less active than they were when they were in their 40s or 50s. So by the same token, the demands they are putting on these implants are much less. So therefore, we are less confident recommending a shoulder replacement for someone who's in their 30s or 40s because over their lifespan, not only are they going to live longer, but they are also going to be demanding more for the implant by the activities that they tend to choose. So is it true that patients in their 30s, 40s, and 50s are too young to have a shoulder replacement? There actually is some data to guide us, so let's take a look. When we talk about implant durability and you look at these charts, these charts are called Kaplan-Meier curves, and they basically are a stair-step representation of how many patients that are being tracked in that cohort fall out because of need for another surgery. So this is a typical Kaplan-Meier curve for people who are over the age of the 65, and you'll see that uh, typically around the 20-year mark, you've got 80% of the original cohort still having the implants functioning. And if you look at a similar graph for people who are under the age of 55, you can see that the survivability of the implant goes down significantly. It's about 60% when you reach the 20 year mark. So that's a double whammy because these patients are obviously going to live longer and they're going to demand more from the implant, causing it, the implant to last not as long. But are we looking at the right data? If we're looking at 20 year survival data of implants, we're talking about implants that were implanted more than 20 years ago. And the implants of today are not like the implants of yesterday. In general, the implants have improved significantly in several ways. Number one, the stem length has decreased significantly, reducing the amount of bone that we have to harvest on the humeral side. Most importantly, the socket of the implant has drastically improved. We know that the weak link in a shoulder replacement is the socket. The socket is made of plastic and it is cemented to the bone. Through a process called the rocking horse phenomenon, the socket is subject to a lot of stress in the forward, back, and up and down motion. When that happens, the underpinnings of the cement actually tends to get loose. So there's been a lot of attention focused on how do we combat the loosening that occurs due to the rocking horse phenomenon. So this is where I think there has been a lot of imp exciting improvement in the last five to 10 years. We see a lot of implants that have come out that have enhanced fixation features. So for example, this is an implant that actually takes advantage of a metal type of peg. This peg system has a central cage which we stuff full of the patient's bone and that allows um, the patient's bone to grow in through all of these pores and it actually will connect to this metal which is titanium which is known as osteointegrative metal. In addition, there have been a couple of implants introduced that try to get rid of the rocking horse phenomenon altogether and this is accomplished by implanting the glenoid into a rim of the bone which surrounds and supports the socket implant circumferentially. This is like using mortise and tenon construction to support the backside and the rim of the implant. This particular implant has three-year data in patients who were high-level athletes. These are young patients who are very demanding, and they found at the end of the three-year study that there was actually no loosening whatsoever. So none of these implants failed. This particular implant has nine-year data showing that in very challenging glenoids in young people who put high demands on their shoulders, there was zero loosening in any of the implants. This implant takes advantage of the fact that the densest bone is in the first four and a half millimeters of the surface. These newer implants I've been discussing have had an impressive track record. Although one of the implants has only a three year track record, it was placed in very demanding patients, including weightlifters. In the other implant, you can see that over the course of almost nine years, none of the implants failed. So if you were to look at a Kaplan-Meier curve of these particular implants, it would essentially be a straight line with 100% of the implants continuing to function. Now this isn't to suggest that all of these implants will continue to have 100% functioning as time goes on. If you follow any implant long enough, you will see that they will eventually wear out. So the point is not so much that these implants are going to last forever, but 
The question I always ask is, are we bending the curve? And I think if you look at these particular implants, the answer seems to be yes. So when I see young and active patients who have arthritis of the shoulder, I still give them all of the precautions and we discuss all of the issues related to their age and the longevity of the implant. However, I do think that my parameters for telling someone that they are too young has significantly changed. I have personally treated many patients who are in their late 30s, early 40s, and 50s who have severe shoulder arthritis and have had a successful result after shoulder replacement. So in general, when I have patients between the age of 35 and 55 who are considering a shoulder replacement, I give them their options, but I don't hesitate to offer them a shoulder replacement, especially using some of these new technologies. Now, although shoulder replacement can be a great solution for many patients, it's not for everyone. So if you or someone you love has shoulder arthritis, please seek out the advice of a medical professional, someone who specializes in the shoulder, and I'm sure they'll be able to help you make the most informed decision. In a future video, I'm going to be talking about the differences between the types of shoulder replacement. There's partial replacement, total shoulder replacement, and reverse replacement. If you like this video, please hit the like button and please subscribe to the channel to learn more about shoulder and arm health trends. Thanks and see you on the next one.